Hello everyone and welcome to APS webinars. The title of today's webinar is A Guide to Career Development, a webinar for young physicists and their mentors. I'm Midhat Farooq and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Today's presentation features Jack Moody, the SPS APS careers intern this summer. Jack will be talking about career preparation of undergraduate students and how advisors can provide guidance. After he finishes the presentation, the remainder of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. You may submit questions through the questions panel at any time during the webinar, and we will answer the questions after the talk. We will do our best to cover all of the questions that you submit but we want to apologize if we are unable to cover everything. Finally, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after today's event and will be made available on the webinar homepage. Please allow five business days for video upload. We encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. And so with that, let's get started. Jack Moody is the current APS Careers Program intern and is a research assistant at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. His current research consists of analyzing nuclear weapons effects in relation to national defense issues. As the APS Careers intern, he has helped with website redesign and the creation of personalized content for a variety of our audiences. Jack was also featured in the June 2020 edition of APS News. He is a rising senior at UMass Amherst where he participates in a variety of nuclear physics research opportunities and mentors fellow first-generation students. Jack, please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Midhat. Hello, everyone. One second, try to get this going, there we go. Hello, everyone, my name is Jack Moody. I'm the APS uh, 2020 Careers Intern, and today I'll be going over a guide to career development, a webinar for young physicists and their mentors. First, just a little bit about me. Uh, in terms of my educational background, I'm a rising senior studying physics and applied math at UMass Amherst. I'm also an Army ROTC cadet. In terms of my research background, uh, since the start of my second semester freshman year, I've been conducting nuclear physics research for the Jefferson Lab uh, at Hall D, working on the pion polarizability experiment, mostly focusing on detector design. And as Midhat mentioned, I will be completing my senior thesis with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. That's an incredibly humbling opportunity, and I'm very excited to see where my research goes with them. In terms of my experience and the actual credibility for being able to give this talk, uh, personally, I love self and career development. I participate in a variety of mentorship programs for fellow first generation physics and math majors at UMass. This upcoming semester will also be my third year as a freshman RA. And of course, as Midhat alluded, I am the 2020 Society of Physics Students APS Careers Programs Intern. Now to go over today's talk, uh, in terms of the actual agenda, We'll begin with the personal introduction and then an introduction of the actual APS Careers website and a little bit more about how this talk will actually flow. It will be a frequently asked question style. I'll be asking and answering five common questions that undergraduate students can, uh, will typically address to their advisors anywhere from their very first day all the way to the end of their undergraduate career. And of course, there'll be time for Q&A at the end. So first, what is the APS Careers website? If you go to APS.org and you get the normal APS landing page, if you look all the way to the top right of the screen where you see right now, highlighted in a red circle, you'll see the Careers in Physics tab. If you click on that or go to APS.org forward slash careers, you'll land on the Careers in Physics landing page. Careers in Physics landing page is the hub for everything that we do here at APS Careers. Uh, it hosts our job board and all the different resources that we'll be going over in today's talk. So. When I go over the different resources that you can provide to your students, we'll be showing you where to find these resources in relation to where they are on this website. Our first question is what kind of careers are out there for physicists? We all know that there are so many different career options for physicists to be able to pursue. So here are some resources to help your students start exploring. First up is the Careers 2020 Guide. 
Uh, if you look at the APS Careers landing page, highlighted in the red circle is the Careers, 20, the Careers 2020 guide. If you click on that blue rectangle or follow the link that's on the screen, you'll be brought to the online version of the Careers 2020 guide. Now, the Careers 2020 guide is a comprehensive list that shows uh, opportunities that are available for, for uh, physicists of all different levels uh, in industry, national labs, the nonprofit sector, and many other areas. Uh, it also provides guidance on how to actually get one of those jobs, whether that be through developing a skills base or a specified resume for that job, developing a skills inventory, or learning how to network in order to get into a specific career field. This is particularly helpful for undergraduates because it can provide specific advice for finding industry careers that are often hard to find within academia. For example, if you look on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see two different testimonials, both from medical physicists. While medical physics is an incredibly important part of industry, it's not often studied at everyday academic institutions. So for some students going through and reading these articles for the first time, this might be their first introduction to medical physics, and it could provide them a new context or a new area of interest for them to be able to pursue for their careers. And a quick tip on how to employ any of the resources within the Careers 2020 guide could be to print out the cover and post it in your office or in the hallway, uh, maybe on a nearby bulletin board, or you can request a physical copy from APS and you can have it either in your classroom or maybe in your office during your office hours for students to be able to read through. Our next resource is the Common Careers Paths. Located right below the Careers 2020 guide, again highlighted in that red circle, is the Common Careers Path link. You can either click on that or follow the hyperlink that's on the screen in order to get to the resource. Now, the Common Careers Path are a guide to a variety of different careers that are out there for physicists to be able to pursue. These include things like being a consultant in industry, faculty at a variety of institutions, both bachelor's degree granting and PhD granting, uh, being a data scientist in industry, or uh, being a national scientist at any of the national labs. Uh, each page covers the educational background typically required for these positions, both the starting and the mid-salary, uh, future outcomes, whether there'll be an increase in demand or a decrease in, de in demand in the, near in the near future, and what a day in the life would look like for any of these physicists. This is particularly useful for students because it can act as a generalized foundation for students to try to figure out what classes or what type of extracurricular activities or internships they should pursue when trying to pursue a career path that's listed under the Common Career Paths uh, links. A quick tip on how to actually advertise this uh, is you could ask your students if they are interested in these specific career paths, or you could show a career path once a week or so in your lecture. An example that comes to mind is, let's say that you're going to be teaching computational physics in this upcoming semester. Let's say it's bright and early on a Wednesday morning. You could actually post the data science in industry common careers path uh, up on up on the screen while you're preparing the rest of your slides and as students are walking in they could passively go through read that information and absorb it and hopefully a few of them will be able to come up to you either at the start or the end of the lecture and have some sort of dialogue learning more about this career path or other resources that they could go down in order to learn more about what it's like to be a data scientist in industry our next resource and some that's very near and dear to my heart is the physicist profiles Located underneath the Common Careers Path link, again highlighted in the red circle, is the link where you can find it on the APS Careers website, or you could follow the URL that's on the screen. Now, the physicist profiles are a set of testimonials and interviews from well over 60 physicists uh, that go over their careers, how they got there, any sort of struggles that they've gone through, or any sort of changes that they've gone through uh, throughout their career, and advice that they would give to current undergraduate students. This can be particularly useful for students because seeing someone that you can identify with succeed in a career that you're interested in is the best way to find a path forward. Uh, it can provide a more personalized foundation for a student to model off of. They can go through, read and understand and empathize with the person's background, see the struggles that they face, possibly even identify with any of those struggles themselves and see what this physicist did in order to overcome those barriers or overcome those challenges. And a quick tip on how to use this uh, is you could display one of these profiles in your slides prior to starting your lecture, kind of following the same idea as the computational physics class. Let's say it's bright and early on a Friday morning. Uh, you're an astrophysicist. 
uh, being asked to teach introductory e for the semester, and you just got a grant passed by NASA. We have a ton of scientists and a ton of physicists on the physicist profile page that are scientists working full-time for NASA. You could post up one of the NASA scientists uh, on your, on your uh, lecture slides or, or on your screen prior to starting your lecture, and hopefully again, students will be able to passively read that information, absorb it, and you could even talk a little bit more about your research or what these scientists do uh, and hopefully be able to engage and get some students starting to think about their future career paths. Up next, we have our webinars for physicists. Moving over to the left-hand side of the APS Careers landing page now, uh, again, highlighted in the red circle is the webinars for physicists link, or you can follow the URL on the screen. Give everyone a few more seconds to be able to find where it's at. Okay, so the webinars for physicists is a series of webinars that are focused on providing a discussion on career guidance and advice from fellow physicists. These physicists range from uh, being in industry and academia or the nonprofit, the non, uh, sorry, the nonprofit sector, and there are even physicists here at APS that host webinars. And the best thing about them is that they're free. You can either find them on the APS Careers website or on YouTube. These can be useful for students because they provide a longer form example of career guidance for students to be able to absorb. They offer advice through both a visual and an auditory component that could oftentimes be a little bit more engaging for students than just going through and reading something on the APS Careers website. These, uh, just so you guys know that these, these webinars can often range anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes in length. So it can be a little bit longer, but there are great resources within them and it's really worthwhile listening and watching. And a tip on how to utilize these within your classroom, uh, you can actually talk about uh, webinars that you've recently seen at the start of your class. For example, if you're teaching introductory e &M, you could say, hey, uh, class, I just recently finished watching Putting Your Science to Work by Dr. Peter Fisk and Dr. Crystal Bailey. Uh, I highly recommend everyone goes and checks it out. You can find it either on the APS Careers website or on YouTube. Uh, or, and I know lecture-based classes are usually very, very crunch for time, but if you're able to fit even one or two minutes in, uh, you could play some of your favorite clips from a webinar during a class. Uh, again, these are available both on the APS Careers website and on YouTube, and these could be a great way for you to start a dialogue and a conversation with your students about career development. Now, our second question is, what can I do to set myself up for success? Your students have been working hard, they've been doing well in their classes, they've been finding research in local labs, but what can they really do to set themselves apart from the rest? There are definitely a variety of things that you can do in order to start preparing for a successful career early on. And here are some ideas that you can provide to your students when this question comes up. First is the Professional Development Guidebook. Again, staying on the left-hand side of the APS Careers landing page, in the Professional Development Guidebook, uh, you can either click on that blue rectangle or follow the URL on the screen to get to the online version of the Professional Development Guidebook. The Professional Development Guidebook uh, is a step-by-step -step guide for how to begin your journey in professional development. Uh, these modules all have different exercises, examples, and video tutorials for students to be able to follow. This can be useful for students because it can provide them a self-paced guide to set themselves up for professional success. Maybe the student only has an hour a week to work on this, or they want to go through all of it at once. They can go at their own pace. And the modules and the lessons within the Professional Development Guidebook can include anything from why start planning uh, for career success now, uh, actually being able to take a self-assessment uh, and see where they're at, uh, developing and taking a skills inventory to see what type of skills they could bring to, to a job, uh, conducting informational interviews, networking, uh, and actually connecting with opportunities, uh, putting together an effective resume, uh, maybe even if they've gotten to the stage, uh, going through and sitting down for the interview and how to negotiate uh, possibly either salaries or stipends or things like that if they're able to get to that stage. It can also provide students uh, a new set of tools that they might not have considered before to put into their professional development toolbox. Uh, on the next slide, I'll actually be going over one that's super important, uh, informational interviews. And a quick tip on how to use this uh, within your own context as an advisor is, let's say you have a student who's preparing to apply for an REU or maybe a full-time job, and they're a little bit nervous about certain parts of the process. Uh, you could sit down with them and either walk through uh, this 
this uh, resource either step by step, uh, module by module, or you can simply send this along to them and tell them it's going to provide them all the resources and all the context that they need in order to hopefully land an interview uh, and hopefully land either that full time job or maybe a grad school application or something like that. Now, a quick aside about informational interviews. Uh, most students actually host or, or they conduct informational interviews all the time without even really realizing it. Let's say you have a student come up to you after your lecture and they start talking to you about your research, uh, your background, your, 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 where you went to grad school, all those types of things. That's really what an informational interview is, and they might not have even realized it. Uh, the strict definition of an informational interview is some sort of brief conversation with someone working in a company, industry, or a field uh, that you would like to learn more about. Uh, these can be useful for anyone from students all the way to professionals trying to change career paths because uh, it's an opportunity to gain perspective and expand your network, uh, oftentimes in dialogue with someone who knows a lot about the field or can help set you up with connections in order to transition or learn more about that particular field. Some examples of how you as an advisor can help your students with informational interviews uh, could be something like the IMPACT program. Uh, the IMPACT program is a way for students to engage and be mentored by industry professionals. You can find it at impact.aps.org, or it's also available on the APS Careers landing page. Another example uh, is trying to connect your current students with alumni or maybe past students. Uh, let's say there was someone in your lab that does some sort of research now that one of your current students is interested in. Providing them their email or phone number so that that student can go and set up an informational interview is a great way to help your current student uh, set themselves up for career success. Another option is developing and giving them connections with people that you've met at conferences. Uh, perhaps it's a scientist that you met at a recent APS conference and your student wants to go down a similar path. Connecting them with that scientist could be a great resource for that student. Up next, we have the job board in the APS Physics Job Center. Uh, everyone wants a job, right? It's, it's pretty important in today's day and age. Uh, so it takes up the vast majority of our website. Uh, if you go all the way to the right hand side, again highlighted in a red circle, you'll see a panel with current job postings uh, or in that pretty teal box all the way at the top of the screen, again highlighted in the red circle, you can type in specific key keywords such as nuclear or Python or data or something like that uh, and it will show uh, recent job postings that uh, come up with the keywords that you specified. And you can either find these, these resources on the APS Careers landing page or if you go to careers.aps.org. Now, specifically the job board in the APS Physics Job Center is a place for employers from a wide variety of backgrounds, such as industry, academia, national labs, or nonprofits, uh, where they go to post jobs that are specifically for people with a physics or hard science background. Uh, and the types of jobs that are posted on here range from full-time professorships to full-time or part-time jobs in industry, even to summer internships for undergrad students. And we'll hint on this again later, but again, I'd like to just highlight that this job center also has job postings for summer research and internships for undergraduate students. Now, the job board is useful for a student because if they go through and click on a job posting that they're interested in, they're going to be exposed to a real world example of a job posting. Uh, and each posting will help provide the student a little bit of context as to how a position is advertised, what type of skills and experiences an employer is looking for, or uh, what type of salary they could expect to have from the get-go uh, and where they could possibly be located if they have to move for that job. Uh, students can use these as a way to prepare their resumes uh, for specific job postings. Like let's say a student uh, wants to go down the data science route. They could look at the job posting that you see here on the screen and should hopefully, after reading it a few times, uh, be able to start pulling out the key words that they would need to include uh, on their resume in order to get to the interview phase. Uh, it is also a great way for them to be able to see what type of extracurriculars they should pursue uh, or what type of classes they could take. For example, if this job posting included having a background in C++, maybe there's a comp sci class or a, a lab on, on campus that they could participate in that would help provide them with the resources necessary to prepare themselves to succeed in that job. Our next question is, how do I successfully advertise myself? Let's say your student has been working really hard, they've been doing research in local labs, they've been putting together a, a bunch of different generalized resources. What can they do to really get the word out there about themselves? Well, let's look and see what resources are out there to help strengthen your students' applications. 
First is the resume, CV, and cover letter module within the Professional Development Guidebook. If you go to the Professional Development Guidebook, click on the resume module, or follow the link on the screen, you'll end up at this module. Now, it's really useful for students to go through this because it provides them uh, with how to write an effective resume. Uh, it goes through and shows them how to find keywords uh, and how to effectively organize the resume so they can get through the algorithms uh, that will be filtering out the people that they're not interested in so that they land on the person's desk so their resume can be looked at and then hopefully set up that interview. Uh, beyond that, it shows a little bit of insights into what the differences are between a curriculum vitae and a resume. Sometimes students will walk in with two or three page resumes and submit that to a job. Sadly, that's not really the path they wanna go down. That's more of a CV type uh, document if, it, if it's that long. Uh, so this module will help show them the difference between a resume and a CV and when to properly use those and in what context you would need a resume and in what context you would need a CV. It also goes over the importance of cover letters. Uh, cover letters are going to be used from graduate school applications to full-time job applications to even internship or REU applications. So getting a student thinking about how to write a cover letter and how to present themselves in that sort of short format uh, is a great resource for these students to help them start preparing for the future. Now, specifically, the resume section is useful for students uh, because it really a lot of students or a lot of people in general will sometimes naively use the same resume for every job that they apply for. Uh, they might apply to 30 jobs online and be incredibly discouraged and disappointed and they don't hear back from any of them. And the reason why that oftentimes happens is because they provided such a generic resume. There's nothing in there for the, for the person reading the resume to be able to see why they'd be a good fit. So the resume module helps walk through with the student uh, the different keywords and different factors that they'll need to include in their resume in order to get through the initial uh, reading phase and actually land that interview. Uh, it'll also help them show how to avoid common mistakes and effectively communicate their potential to their employers. That could be anything from uh, reorganizing their resume to putting certain things at the top and putting things, uh, certain other things lower on the resume to those keywords to anything like that. Uh, up next, we have avenues for marketing yourself. You wanna actually get out there and, and, and display your talents or display that, that brand new resume or all the different things that you've been working on. How can you actually go through and do that? First off, we have LinkedIn. It's a professional networking site. Think about it like a professional version of Facebook. I hope everybody listening uh, actually has a LinkedIn profile. If you don't, uh, we strongly recommend that you go and make one uh, and connect with APS. We post all sorts of really great content on there. Uh, LinkedIn is a great way for you to be able to talk about your research interests, be able to show all the different projects that you've worked on uh, and connect with like-minded people and develop your professional network in an online setting. And it's a great resource from any professional starting from high school students all the way through tenured faculty. Uh, it's a great, great resource. Up next, we have alumni events. Uh, these are usually set up by the university and by the specific department. Um, and it's a great way for current undergraduate students to meet with either recently graduated alumni or maybe even uh, alumni that are well established within their career. And those current undergraduate students can help, uh, sorry, can start to speak with these alumni so that those alumni can help show them uh, how they got to where they're at, how they use the exact same skills that they're getting from the same institution that those students are currently at to get to the jobs they're at currently. Uh, it can also be a great networking opportunity uh, in order to help show the students that are there currently what type of job opportunities are out there for them or the alumni could actually help provide some sort of good word or provide some sort of network connection if a student wants to go down a similar career path to that alumni. There are also conferences. Uh, APS hosts a wide variety of conferences, whether that be the April meeting uh, to division meetings uh, like DAMOP or the Division of Nuclear Physics or other meetings such as QWIP. Uh, these are great ways for students to learn about cutting edge research and network, whether that be with like-minded scientists in academia so they could start doing some networking for a future graduate school application or meeting businesses that are out there uh, that are doing some sort of R&D in a field they're interested in. Conferences are a great way for students uh, to develop their network and get some exposure and learning how to do elevator pitches and things like that 
to help get the word out there about their skills. There are also career fairs. Um, sadly, obviously right now during the COVID environment, there really aren't any, hopefully, uh, in-person career fairs going on. Uh, but hopefully in the post-COVID environment, there will be career fairs uh, where these are great opportunities for students, again, to be able to network and find out what type of companies are looking for. Uh, this could include anything from just being able to get the word out there or learning about new careers they never heard about before, uh, or developing those first points of contact, collecting those business cards, things like that, so that they could help follow up and do some of those informational interviews or some of the other resources that they might have learned in order to help figure out what the next steps are to land a job with a company or graduate school that they're interested in. Uh, quick, a quick note here uh, is that APS, during all of our meetings, we do host career fairs. Um, they're a very integral part of the APS meeting uh, and they're great opportunities. But uh, if your students or you are unable to attend one of these career fairs, all the jobs and all those postings are posted uh, on the job center and on the job board after the event is done. So don't think just because you couldn't attend the conference that you missed out on all those career opportunities. Uh, all those resources and all those jobs are still posted on the job board after the meeting is done. Now, your students have been working so hard, but they want to expand past their current university walls. And they're trying to ask you how to best prepare for applying to an internship or an REU. Now, as undergraduate advisors, you are all well aware that these are great opportunities for students to invest in, and we all want our students to succeed. So here are some resources that you can provide to your students to help them reach their goals. First off is the actual internships page that APS has, APS Careers has. Um, if you go again to the job board, click on summer internships or follow the link on the screen. What you'll see is a list of common REUs and internships that are hosted by a variety of academic institutions, national labs, other companies, or even nonprofits like here at APS. Uh, our job postings and the internships like I'm in are available on this website. It's useful for students to go through and see such a long and comprehensive list of the different types of jobs and REUs that are out there so you can actually get a feel for the real world of physics and really just how applicable all the different skills that they're building are in the real world. This could be anything from uh, actually going and doing hard science at a uh, national lab or, or at an academic institution or using their physics background for something here like at APS. Uh, where they might not be doing uh, research-based physics, but they're still helping out the physics community. Um, however, we do know that these positions are usually quite competitive. Uh, so offering your students uh, such a wide array of places to apply to will help them learn how to uh, prioritize what they want, help them get used to the, to the application process, uh, and maybe even sadly, uh, get used to the rejection process as well. And it's a very important, um, rhythm and process that they're going to need to develop and, and get disciplined in once the actual job hunt begins for them. Because uh, sadly, not everyone's going to get the very first job they apply for. So teaching your students how to develop those priorities, actually build those applications, ask for letters of rec, all those different things are going to be very important skills for them to build not only as undergraduates, but in their future careers as well. Again, I'll also highlight the job board in the APS Physics Job Center. Uh, these offer full-time jobs for students, uh, part-time jobs, internships, uh, everything under the sun. It's a great resource for students to be able to, to look at. Um, you might be asking yourself, Jack, thank you for all this. This, 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 this is a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, but how do I actually incorporate this? And what are some actual concrete examples of how I can incorporate what you're showing me here into my lectures or advising meetings? Well, let's break it down step by step. First, Let's take lectures, for example. You can actually go through and show specific profiles or career paths uh, before or during your lectures. Again, going back to the computational physics example, putting up that data scientist in industry example, uh, you could actually go through and talk with your students about how the resources, uh, the problem solving skills, and the, the coding language skills that they're developing in this class can directly apply to that career path. You could also show specific webinar clips and discuss them during class, especially if they, they pertain to the lecture or the material that you're about to cover. Uh, and if you come across a similar topic to a profile or webinar, you can go on a short aside about it. Uh, again, thinking back to the 
NASA or, or, or the NIST examples, if, if you're teaching modern physics or anything like that, going through and being able to connect the, the cutting edge research that they're doing at those institutions with what you're covering in class uh, are a great way to help motivate students and show them some concrete examples and how what they're learning in class can help prepare them for their future careers. Up next, we have what to actually do during your advising meetings with students. Uh, you could begin uh, by trying to prompt your students to start thinking about career goals uh, by going through the professional development guidebook, actually sitting down with them and showing them the modules and maybe brainstorming something like the skills inventory uh, or even help motivate them to try to figure out why they should start planning now and why it's so important to start planning early. You could also have your students choose two or three profiles beforehand. Uh, that way that you're, a you're able to gauge your students' interest and you're able to see what they're actually interested in from the get-go. If they show up uh, with a very specific skill set and, and they, they have certain people they want to emulate, you can help show them what the next steps could be, certain classes to take, certain internships to participate in, or extracurricular activities that could help set them down the same path as that physicist they're inspiring to emulate. Or, and this is a little bit more labor intensive and a little bit more time consuming, but I think it will have really, really great effects, uh, is prior to your meetings, you could send out a questionnaire to your students, uh, asking them what their hobbies are or their passions, or extracurricular class that they're taking, so that you could begin brainstorming what type of careers they might be interested in uh, prior to and then during your meeting. For example, if you have a student uh, that has expressed a lot of interest in hardware design, uh, for example, they're really into Arduinos and printed circuit board design. You can help show them any of the profiles that we have about NIST technicians or NASA technicians or high school teachers or anything like that that could help show them how their current passion for hardware and problem solving can apply directly to their future careers. And finally, there's always passive absorption. Uh, going through and walking through the hallways and seeing posters, things like that. Uh, for example, you could print and post either specific articles from the Careers 2020 guide, uh, whether that be specific articles from a physicist or the how to write an effective resume article or just the cover. Uh, you could print them out, post them on bulletin boards, have them in your office, anything like that. Or you can actually request uh, multiple or even an, individ an individual uh, paper uh, hard copy of the Careers 2020 guide from APS and we can send it to you so that your students can read through it. You can also print out interesting internships or job postings for your office. I'm a bit biased as an aspiring nuclear physicist, but uh, if someone went through and read a recent job posting uh, from Oak Ridge or Lawrence Livermore, uh, they could go through and print out that job posting and post it on their bulletin board. And I know myself, I'd, I'd be very interested in reading that and seeing what type of opportunities are out there. Uh, or again, a little bit more time consuming, but I think there's gonna be a lot of great feedback from it. Uh, you could send out actual emails uh, including your favorite resources and why uh, to your students. So that hopefully they'll be able to read through them, digest it a bit and follow up with you and provide some sort of feedback or provide some sort of questions to engage with you about career development. And that just about sums it up for me. I wanna thank you all for attending and for being here. Uh, it really means a lot to me. Uh, if anyone has questions or comments, please feel free to leave them uh, either here during the Q&A session or feel free to email me at moody at APS.org. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy out there, uh, and thank you all very much for attending. All right, thank you so much, Jack, for that wonderful and comprehensive uh, talk that listed all of our resources. Um, we will start taking questions now, so if uh, you have a question, again, please feel free to um, enter it into the questions box, um, and we'll start going through them. So. The first question we have is, what advice would you give for an undergrad student with limited access to research opportunities who wants to get into a graduate program after completing their bachelor's degree? That, that's an awesome, awesome question. Um, there's always research and, and internship opportunities out there for people to be able to pursue. Um, maybe there's another uh, university within a few miles that you'd be able to go to that offers research. Uh, if that's not a possibility, uh, there are also the internships that we talked about uh, on the APS job board uh, or at any sort of uh, RU applications that you could apply for. Um, while competitive, uh, I think those are great opportunities for students to be able to pursue and help strengthen their graduate school applications. Uh, there are also alternatives to just research uh, that can strengthen a graduate school application. Uh, for example, being a teaching assistant. Um, 
Maybe you're somewhere where there is no research, but if you're able to TA a few different classes, that still shows professional development and maturity and the ability to conduct yourself in a manner that would be helpful for a graduate school application. So don't think if you can't do research, you're absolutely down and out for graduate school application. There are plenty of resources to be able to get to research, but there are also other opportunities like being a teacher's assistant uh, that can definitely help you strengthen your application. Yeah, I completely agree. And I've um, again, uh, this was in Jack's talk, but I've linked our internships page where you can find a very long list of REU opportunities um, that you can apply for. I would also say that um, you can always reach out to faculty members at your own institution um, and see, you know, especially during this COVID era that we're in, you can see if there are opportunities where you can still um, conduct research uh, and telework, right? Maybe there are different computation, um, computation or analysis that you can work on um, and get uh, get experience that way. But absolutely, um, what Jack said. That, sorry, go ahead, Jack. Oh no, 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 you're, you're totally fine, Matt. But um, I, I I hate to kind of self promote here, but but the uh, if this is an undergraduate student asking this. Um, I wrote an article for the APS June, uh, the June 2020 edition. It's a back page article uh, that kind of goes over what Midhat just said and, and how to um, request either just simple data sets for you to be able to go over to start getting some of that practice and things like that uh, from from professors. Um, so that's another resource you can go to too is the, the June 2020 back page article, uh, especially during the COVID environment. This might help you uh, start developing some of those research skills. Yes, I will um, link that in the chat shortly. Um, okay, so here's a question. Um, I did my master's in 2008 in physics and around and got around seven years of teaching experience in India. Presently, I'm on H4 visa in the United States and want to keep it up with my subject. What should I do? Um, Jack, do you have anything for that? I can also take that one. Well, first, congrats on all that teaching experience. Um, I would say that there there is and in, in Midhat you're you're much more well versed in this than I am, um, but there there is the the International Students Affairs uh, subsection of of APS uh, that should hopefully be able to find um, what you need there. But there there are still job postings things like that that are teaching related uh, on the uh, APS job board. So if you're still interested in teaching, uh, I'd still check out that resource. It's not just research based jobs that are posted on there. And yes. Matt, I don't know if you want to talk about the uh, other aspect of the question. Yeah, so definitely um, look into what other people have done with a master's degree, um, what teaching opportunities are out there. Um, I would also say that networking is a very, very big part of finding any job. Um, so work on that network, talk to as many people as you can who are in fields that you're interested in working in. Um, I'm going to link, as for the visa issue, I am going to link um, our international uh, resources page that uh, might be able to provide you with some uh, visa help um, and resources for that. Um, and I will also say that we have a mentoring program that Jack mentioned. Um, it's called IMPACT, which is Industry Mentoring for Physicists. So that's a great place for you to find uh, mentors, um, for you to just talk to people and um, hear about their career paths and learn what they are doing and how they got there. Um, so I highly recommend um, that program as well. Okay, next question. Uh, question. Do you have any advice for students who are interested in possibly going into a non-STEM field after graduation? Uh, ab absolutely. Um, no matter what, getting a physics bachelor's degree shows uh, that you're an incredible critical thinker and you're a great problem solver. Uh, no matter what, those are skills that you will have gained throughout a physics degree. Uh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with changing uh, career paths or anything like that after your bachelor's degree. Um, there aren't specific resources that were given in this talk uh, about that, but um, there is the Career Shape Up series, uh, which is something that Midhat and I started this summer during my internship that's available on the APS Careers website. If you go to the landing page on that big right-hand panel where the job board was, uh, there's the Career Shape Up email series. Um, click on that link. Sign up for it. Uh, it'll provide you a great list of resources um, that are interactive in, in a sense um, to help bolster your resume and help figure out what type of jobs might be right for you. Um, there are, again, I would, I would hark back to uh, trying to develop that network and seeing what else is out there. Um, and 
I don't know exactly specifically what you're interested in, but there are a lot of physicists that go on to pursue law degrees or something like that. Um, there are plenty of resources out there. There's also plenty of science policy advocates uh, out there. If you go and look up any of those resources, uh, that's kind of the avenue that you're looking to head down. Uh, Google can oftentimes help with that. Um, but sadly, there aren't any specific resources I can give you for APS. Um, Jack, can I chime in? Hi, everybody. Crystal Absolutely. Bailey, Career Programs. One other thing I'll just quickly mention, it's just like Jack said, it, there's so many things you could do and there's no one place to harness absolutely everything. So I just want to reiterate again the the value of doing these informational interviews and trying to mm -hmm. find people who are out there in the community doing stuff. Maybe they have a physics degree, but they're not doing you know anything like academic physics research, which is all you've seen. Um, really try to meet as many people as you can and have as many informational interviews so you can really learn about what's out there. That's that's really the the best way to get that information. I, I couldn't agree more, Crystal. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Um, great answers. And we have more questions coming in. Um, awesome. is, it, is it recommended for an undergraduate to focus solely on learning physics? Um, so I'm not quite sure I understand the full context of the question. Uh, it is always helpful to diversify, especially if it's something that you're interested in. Uh, for example, let's say you're really into art history. Uh, you don't just have to take physics and math classes in order to be a successful physicist. Uh, going out and diversifying your educational background uh, will help provide perspective for you no matter what career you head into, whether it's pure research or, or going and being a teacher or being a, a policy advocate up on Capitol Hill. Um, if you're interested in something, pursue it. Uh, you never know where things will lead and what type of opportunities are out there if you pursue it. So don't think just because you're a physics undergraduate, you can only study physics your entire time in college. Uh, that also goes along with internship opportunities. Um, specifically, this internship that I'm in now uh, as an undergraduate isn't strict physics research. Uh, I use physics principles every single day, such as first principles, learning how to problem solve, do those types of things but I'm not doing pen and paper problem solving sets. I, I'm not actually going through and doing that. Um, but it's still a great career and, and a great way to use your physics background to diversify and still help people and contribute um, to another industry. I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but don't think that you just have to study physics. There, there are so many other things that you can pursue uh, or even use your physics background in another context. Yeah, that is a great answer, Jack. Thank you. And I want to add, um, not only should you feel free to um, diversify what you're learning, but I would encourage you to do that. Um, a lot of employers in industry, and to be honest, even in academia, there's so many skills uh, that come that you need to succeed that aren't always taught in physics classes. For example, um, uh, recently there was a survey that was conducted of employers that hire that have hired physicists and worked with them. Um, and some of the skills they mentioned that are really important are um, you know, teamwork, being able to communicate to different audiences. Um, these are skills that are sometimes taught in physics, but not always. So if you can find these skills through extracurricular activities or other classes, um, that will definitely help you succeed in whatever career path you choose to follow. Uh, one quick thing that I'll add, this is advice that I got as a first semester freshman uh, from someone who works for the Pacific Northwest National Labs, who's an alumni of UMass, informational interview type situation. Uh, he said, take as many opportunities to write as possible, uh, whether that be through English classes or through your gen eds, anything like that. Learning how to write is a critical skill for any, um, for, for any sort of field that you go into and being comfortable writing and being able to communicate and advocate uh, for yourself or maybe for others or a product that you're working on is a critical and very helpful skill. So if I can encourage you to study anything else, uh, try to get as much exposure to writing as possible. Oh, can I also chime in again? Sorry. Um, for those educators who are actually in the audience, I want to highlight a resource at George Washington University as part of a pipeline, a pipeline program, which is a program APS is working on to develop curricular approaches to teaching these uh, really extra workforce relevant skills. Um, there was a great communications capstone course that was developed by them. So I will also link to that in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Crystal. 
All right, next question. Um, so I'm going to combine these two questions because they are related. Um, I am an undergraduate freshman. Do you have any advice for me because my college has very limited physics research opportunities? So we did um, answer that one uh, or a similar one earlier. Um, and then also there is, do you have resources for international undergraduate students to do research? Most REUs in my experience require US citizenship. So for both of these questions, I'm again going to link our um, internships page you can feel free to browse through this page and look at uh, which internships are also available for undergraduate, um, for international students. Um, and again, if you don't have that many research opportunities at your current institution, go ahead and look in this page to apply for REUs outside of your own institution. Um, and I will say for the, just one last thing, for the um, international students, um, there are national labs that you might be able to get um, a position at. Um, and for example, this SPS internship program, I know an international student currently working in it um, for one of the national labs that SPS partners with. So if you, um, if you like, you can apply to some of these internships. There are definitely, some are definitely available for international students. Um, Jack, go ahead. Sure, uh, those are all incredibly pertinent and thank you, Midhat. But the uh, stuff that I, I'm hearing consistently is, is um, being discouraged if your if your undergraduate institution doesn't have a lot of research opportunities, um, don't think that's the end of the road, and that you can't get exposure to research. Um, there are grants you can go out there and find either through through NSF or, or DOE or things like that that are relatively small that you could help a professor could help you study. Um, you could be really into Arduinos and and you want to work with, with those types of products. The, those types of small grants uh, could help you get exposure to that type of research activity, um, or uh, if you're really into it, uh, there are so many different free online resources uh, that can help get you to understand the problem solving required and the different research um, methodologies that are out there. You, you, uh, YouTube is a great resource. Um, MIT Open Courseware, uh, anything like that. Um, Code Academy, things like that. There's a great way to learn skills and resources uh, out there on your own um, outside of your institution to help bolster your research skills and capabilities. Um, just don't, don't think just because, uh, your, your school doesn't necessarily have research opportunities that that's the end of the road. Uh, you, there's definitely ways you can go out there and find things yourself, um, or try to ha have professors step in and help with the grants and things like that. So you can do something with a professor. Absolutely. Thank you, Jack. Next question, what advice would you give an undergraduate student who knows he's interested in physics, however, understand things a bit slower than others? That's definitely a really good question. Um, the, the, the biggest thing with physics, um, in, in, in obviously I'm, 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 a, I'm a rising senior, so I only have so much exposure to, to the actual, what it's like to be a physicist, um, but learning how to roll with the punches uh, and really being okay with, with kind of getting beat down, maybe you didn't quite get the grade that you want, maybe things like that, but, but learning how to get back up again and developing that resiliency um, is incredibly, incredibly important as a physicist. And, and it's a skill that's gonna be useful for the rest of your life. Uh, and I think it's a unique skill that a lot of physics undergraduates get to develop because uh, the curriculum is incredibly difficult. Um, the biggest thing is please don't get discouraged. Uh, you can do it, you can succeed. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help, uh, whether that be through TAs that are in your class or, or going to the professor's office hours um, or talking to the professor maybe about getting extra time on tests or taking uh, tests at different times of day. Maybe you're a morning person, but your tests are at seven or eight at night. Uh, that can have huge effects uh, in, your, in your grade outcomes. Um, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself uh, and, and ask for more resources or ask for help. Um, and don't think, and you, I'm not quite sure the specific circumstances, but everyone struggles with different things. Uh, and don't think just because you're struggling in one class, that's the end of your physics career. Because uh, if you develop that resiliency, you can and will get back up and you will succeed at the end of the day. Um, we all have faith in you and you can definitely succeed. Did not agree more. Thank you, Jack. Um, okay, next question. Would it be possible to enter into a master's program for physics with a bachelor's in engineering? Um, I would definitely, um, I would definitely say, say so. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it maybe is quite as easy as a path of as having a physics uh, bachelor's degree, but uh, it all comes down to that problem solving skills, right? 
um, being able to provide concrete examples of how you as an engineering undergrad uh, used uh, using uh, first first principles, uh, learn, learning problem solving skills through maybe your fluid dynamics classes or things like that, being able to provide concrete examples to the admissions committee of how you are an engineer, um, but you still develop the core competencies that are required for a physicist, but also, and I think almost more importantly, you'll provide a different perspective than the other undergraduates, I'm sorry, than the other graduate students that you'll be entering with that came from a physics background. Uh, coming from engineering, you took different classes, uh, you had different experiences, you had different exposures to different types of maybe math or different type of skills. Um, advocate for that, to say how you would be a resource uh, and how you could help provide different perspectives. Um, beyond that, uh, networking is a huge thing. Uh, maybe reach out to, um, advisors that you're interested in or, or, or certain programs that you're interested in and, and see if they have any sort of advice for you on how to help tailor your application. Um, and don't be discouraged. Uh, if you don't get in the first time, but it's something you're really passionate about, feel free to apply again. Keep networking, keep trying. And again, that resiliency is, is such a paramount skill to have. Um, at the end of the day, we're all problem solvers here in, in the, the this hardcore physics engineering background. So if you can prove those problem solving skills, that, that's what really counts. Yep, exactly. Um, your background is your background. Everyone has a uh, you know, different set of skills, different backgrounds that they bring in. So apply, talk about why you're qualified, um, and definitely reach out to faculty members um, at the institutions that you're interested in so that at least they'll remember your name, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, uh, and they can definitely help uh, help you tailor your application for sure. Thank you, Jack. That was a great answer. Um, okay, next question. I spent my first three years of undergrad aiming to go to grad school and only focused on research. I now realize grad school is not for me. How can I leverage my research experience into a non-STEM job? Most of my advisors only know about the academic path or STEM industry path. So, Based on that last part there, you saying that uh, you're not necessarily interested in uh, physics grad school, you're not necessarily interested in in the the STEM industry aspect. Uh, I'm I'm going to assume here, and maybe it's it's unfair to assume that you're maybe interested in maybe maybe it's teaching or or patent law or something like that. That's a little bit outside the realm of uh, the the everyday um, physics professor. Uh, the biggest thing is networking. Um, even in the the COVID environment, um, there are people are, are more than ever before attached to their phone and their email. Uh, find people that that you aspire to be like and and reach out to them. Um, if you're you're courteous and and you're kind and and you provide a good pitch to them, which are all listed in the professional development guidebook. If if you go through and follow those steps, um, hopefully they'll be able to respond and reach out to you. And you'll be able to learn a little bit more. Um, also, when it, when it comes to your actual application. Having a strong research background is never a bad thing. You're a problem solver. You're learning how to work with limited resources. You're learning how to work in teams. If even the most remote theorists have to consult other people, you definitely have worked in a team and worked to solve problems and came together to solve a common, uh, for a common goal. You can learn how to extrapolate those skills that you gained and convey it properly uh, for the specific application you're going for. Um, your research experience will never hurt you. Um, again, network, uh, go through the professional development guidebook. Um, Google is always your friend. Um, and if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I specifically have, um, experience not working, uh, working out outside of the, the normal STEM area. Um, so feel free to email me if you want. Um, we can develop a further dialogue there. Yeah, and I'm going to quickly link our physicist profiles page again. Um, it's now organized by different sectors, so you can actually go look at um, academic people who have followed the academic path and people who have followed um, who have a career in public service, people who are working in the private sector and national labs. So you can get an idea of um, what sort of work people are doing in the different areas um, to um, start forming your own career goals and figuring out what you want to do. Okay, next question. How often is advanced mathematics used during undergrad or grad physics research? Is it more helpful to develop programming skills instead? Well, I'll, I'll begin this answer by saying I'm still an undergraduate. 
<laughs> um, so, so, so my context only goes so far and hopefully Crystal or Midhat will be able to bail me out with an actual PhD perspective. Um, but I think it's going to vary day to day. Um, in, in my nuclear experience, there are certain days where I spend the whole day coding uh, and do almost no math. Uh, and there are other days where I actually have to pull out pen and paper and actually solve a gradient or, or actually solve a differential equation or something like that. Um, so it, it will vary. Um, it never hurts to learn more math, and it also never hurts to learn more coding uh, languages or new contexts to use those languages in. Um, but as for tailoring one or the other, I think that comes down to personal preference and where you want to go specifically. Uh, for example, if you're trying to go into soft matter, those skills are going to be very different than what are needed for a particle physicist. Um, so perhaps, again, going back to that networking opportunity, um, finding people that are in a field that you're interested in and, and asking this question to them might help yield uh, more specific answers for your case. Um, but of course, I don't have a PhD, so Crystal or Midhat, if you want to provide some perspective, it also, I'm sure, be much appreciated. Yeah, um, no. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Crystal. Well, uh, I mean, we, I, I, speaking as a person who got a PhD in physics, and so did Midhat, I mean, I think we would probably both agree that, uh, you know, advanced mathematics is absolutely, absolutely crucial yeah. Um, to do graduate research. I mean, um, and and most graduate programs will still have very rigorous sort of advanced math uh, courses. Um, I will also go farther to say that um, the one of the things that makes physicists such exceptional problem solvers is precisely our comfort with yielding the machinery of mathematics to solve any problem. <laughs> Being able to, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Being able to use it to solve anything is is literally what makes one of the things that makes physics graduates like superstars in 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 the working world. And um, so it's very very important. That said, programming skills are also an absolutely essential uh, thing that you need to learn. The different context in which, in which it can be applied when you graduate and go into whatever career path you want. It's it's almost limitless. So I'd say both. <laughs> that. Yeah. So I, you know, I had um, some, a graduate student give me really great advice when I was an undergraduate student. I was majoring in physics and math as an undergraduate, and I was trying to figure out which upper level math courses to take um, to improve my chances of succeeding in graduate school. And what this uh, graduate student told me is, you know, it's not about how much math you know, it's about being comfortable at, and understanding the language, right? So once you have gotten experience in say one or two upper level math courses, you now have the tools to learn more complex math. And as long as you have developed that tool set, honestly, you don't, you know, you don't have to completely do a math major. Um, you just need that tool set so that um, A, the graduate school and your research advisors know that you are capable of learning additional math. And then if it comes up, if a new topic comes up in your research and you aren't familiar with it yet, that's okay because you, you will be comfortable enough to teach it to yourself or go read about it and get the resources you need to learn. Um, and again, uh, computational tools, I think that's definitely the world we're moving towards. So I would I would emphasize learning um, how to how to uh, program and as Jack said, also prioritize your own um, interests. If you've tried programming and you absolutely hate it, that's okay. <laughs> then you can go back to that math or go back to your other um, interests. Um, okay, so I think that is all the time we have for today. Thank you everyone for. Um, for calling in and asking all these wonderful questions. We apologize if we did not get to your question. We encourage you to follow up by sending an email to webinars at APS.org or to Jack at Moody at APS.org. And we will, um, we will try to answer all of your questions. A recording of the video will be emailed to you within five business days and will also be posted on the summer webinar homepage. Lastly, in order to help APS continue to develop quality webinar presentations, please help us by taking a moment to complete the short survey as you exit the webinar today. This wraps up today's event. We hope you'll join us again next time. American Physical Society, copyright 2020, all rights reserved. <laughs>